In this video, I'm going to show you how you can stream live level 2 order book data from your data source using WebSockets in Python. I'll also show you how to save the data down to disk for historical purposes and why I choose to store order book updates in plain text. Throughout this tutorial, I'll be using Binance as my example data source and I encourage you to follow along even if you use a different data source because the same concepts will transfer over and once you've built the example for Binance, you'll very easily be able to adapt it for your data set if you're streaming data from let's say Polygon or another crypto exchange like FTX. You don't need an account, the API is completely free to use no API key required. And by the end of the video, you'll have a script that can download both order book snapshots via the REST API, as well as stream updates to be applied to that order book via a WebSocket with up to a 100 millisecond granularity. And that way, when it comes to backtesting your strategies, you'll be able to walk through the historical order book in steps as low as 100 milliseconds to examine your impact on the market or to test any strategy that might be based on something like order book imbalances. So without the way, let's go ahead and dig into Python. So we can head on over to the documentation here. I'll leave a link in the description. And the first endpoint that we'll want to look at here is in their REST API. So you go to market data endpoints here and then order book. We can request a snapshot of the order book to a given depth. So this will give us a response that looks like this and it will give us the bids and the asks to the required depth that we ask for here. So if I set a limit of five here, a depth of five, it's going to give me the top five bids and asks at the lowest level of granularity. So we go to the lowest level here. And if I asked for five levels, it would give me these five here. The same on the bid side down here. So if you ask for a hundred, you're going to get a hundred on both sides, both on the bid and the ask. So that's what this does here, and it allows us to request up to 5,000 different price levels, which depending on the pair that you're looking at, is almost certainly going to be enough. There's only really Bitcoin that has significantly more price levels than this, but even for pairs like BTC, USDT, where there's lots of price levels, 5,000 is certainly enough if you take a snapshot every hour or so or every time the price moves by a given amount so you might ask why we don't just use this endpoint and keep requesting snapshots of the full order book here and just have that delivered to us via rest api and then save that down there are two main reasons for that the first one is that Binance won't let us. Requesting this much data is very heavy on their servers. And so they assign a maximum number of times that you can request this data per minute. So you can see there's a wait here. So if I asked for 5,000 price levels, that's a wait of 50. And I believe the maximum you can currently use in a minute is 1,200. So you can only do 24 of these requests every minute from Binance. The second reason is that even if you do rest requests as fast as you possibly can, it's much slower than a WebSocket connection. So you're not going to be able to realistically attain consistent 100 millisecond updates on your order book, especially if you're requesting multiple pairs whereas that's very easily accomplished using a WebSocket. So that's great. We've got this order book snapshot here that we can grab. 
But how do we keep this order book updated? Well, the next endpoint that we'll need is a WebSocket stream down here. And what we can do is we can stream the differences in the order book over a given period of time. So you can select either one second or 100 milliseconds and every interval, Binance will push this information to you. So the changes in the order book. So if we go back to an example here, you can see these levels are changing all the time. If I subscribe to the WebSocket, I will get notified every single time a price level updates the amount of ETH that they're willing to buy or sell at. So we can see these levels are appearing and disappearing. If I subscribe to this WebSocket, I'll get updated every single time that happens. If more volume is added to a price level, I'll also get that information. So you can see for this example here, on the bid side, this price level of 0.0024 now has a quantity of 10. So there's a bid for 10 BNB at a price of 0.0024 BTC. And we just need to update our order book with that information. So now that we've had a look at the different endpoints, let's jump into Python and start building this out. So you'll need a few different libraries here to get going. We'll need async.io since that's how we interact with WebSockets using the WebSockets library. So you'll also need that. So from WebSockets, import connect. We'll also need a few other libraries. So I'll import AIO files. This is a library that allows us to read and write to files asynchronously on disk. It's important because the functions we're going to be writing are going to be asynchronous coroutines using async IO. So we need to work within that framework. I'll also import Sysia. I'll import JSON. And I'll also import HTTPX here, which is very similar to the requests library, but it allows us to make requests asynchronously, which is what we want. So let's start off by creating this new function here. We'll call it order book download. And for now, it's just going to take in the pair. So BTC USD, ETH USD, something like that. Its only job is going to be to download the order book. And I'll just leave that as pass for now. Or perhaps I'll put a print statement here just saying hello. And in order to run this function, you'll need some special syntax. It's not like a regular Python function. This async here turns it into a coroutine. And so you have to use async IO in order to run it. If you're doing this tutorial in a Jupyter environment, you'll want to use await, so await, then the name of the function, and then any arguments, so BTC USDT, for example. If you're in a regular Python IDE like I'm in now, so I'm just in Vim, if you're in Visual Studio Code or something similar, you'll want to run this coroutine using async io.run and then enclose within that the function name and any arguments. So if I run this now, we get a nice message. But if I just try to do order book download here, and then just give it some random string, you can see it never actually runs. It just gives us this warning and the hello never gets printed. So that was just a quick reminder on how to run async IO coroutines. It'll be important throughout the rest of the video. So we've got this function here. Let's go ahead and subscribe to the WebSocket. So this is the format that we want. So we want symbol at depth. And then we also need the WebSocket URL. So if you go to the documentation, there'll be a URL that looks something like this. It'll start with WSS. In this case, it's stream.binance.com. So let's grab that. 
And I'll just put this inside of the function here. So I'll say URL is equal to this. And then we need to pay attention to the format because we want to subscribe to a particular stream. So we only want one stream in this example. So I'm going to use this format. Although you can subscribe to multiple streams using this format. All you have to do is change the URL. So it's slash WS slash stream name. And as we saw before, the stream name is symbol at depth or symbol at depth at 100 milliseconds if you want more frequent updates. So let's try that out and see what that looks like. So it's slash WS slash the symbol at depth. One thing that's peculiar to Binance here is that the symbol has to be lowercase when subscribing to a WebSocket. So I'm just going to create a pair lower here and that's just going to be paired lower. We'll just make sure that the pair is actually in lowercase here. And then when we subscribe to the WebSocket, we can be confident that it's going to work. I've had that happen to me a few times where the REST API wants the value in uppercase, but the WebSocket wants the value in lowercase. So you have to be careful with your strings here. Okay, that's great. We've got our URL. Now let's subscribe to the WebSocket. And we can do that here really, really easy with this connect here that we imported from the WebSockets library. So we just need to do async with connect. Then we pass in the URL as WebSocket. So this handy context manager here is going to handle all of the initial subscribing to the WebSocket opening the connection, making sure that it responds to the heartbeats from the Binance WebSocket. This will deal with all of that for us. And when we exit out of this async with here, it will also handle gracefully disconnecting from the WebSocket. So we're in here, what do we want to do? Well, we want to grab some data from the WebSocket. We want to get updates to our order book. So we'll do data, equals await websockets.recv here, so receive. And then after that, we'll just print on out our data here so we can have a look at it. And our async io.run here should get that going. Looks like the server rejected our URL here, and it's because I forgot to set this to an F string. It should work now. There we go. You can see we're getting all of these arrays here of price levels and the quantity that's available at those levels. This is for BTC USDT. So you can see that every second here, there's a, a gratuitous amount of new bids and asks being added. I'll switch this over to a pair that is less frequently updated. So we'll do uni USDT, for example. And then if we try that, you'll see we get a much more manageable amount of bids and asks to be updated. It does take a few seconds here because it's handling subscribing and then unsubscribing to the WebSocket. You can see the program ends straight away. So if we want to continually get data from this WebSocket, we can just wrap this up in a while true loop here. So while true, get updates and print the update. And this will repeat continuously until we use control C to stop it. So we can sit here and watch the updates go by. You'll get one every second here. And if I press control C in my terminal, that will stop it. it might be slightly different depending on your IDE. It will take a few seconds there because it's disconnecting from the WebSocket. I believe if you use control C twice, that will force a disconnect, but that can have some implications when you try and reconnect later on. The server might still believe that you're connected. So we've got our data here. Now we need to worry about storage. So a system that works really well here, surprisingly well in fact, is just to save down the update 
as a raw text file. So we don't need to worry about saving this into some kind of database. Just saving it down as a raw text file is actually a pretty decent option. And so we'll do that now with AIO files. So this is yet another asynchronous context manager here. So it's another async with AIO files dot open and then give it a file name. So what I'm going to do here is I'll set this to the name of the pair. So pair lower, let's say dash updates. And then I'll also add the current date in there. So we'll import date time here or from date time, import date time. So we'll get today's date. So today is equal to date time dot date time dot date. And we'll insert that date into the file name here. So it'll be sol usdt dash updates dash today. Feel free to mess around with this and find a name format that works for you. So we'll add today in here and then it's just going to be a plain old .txt. The mode with which we write to it is going to be append. So this will create the file if it doesn't exist. And if it does exist, we're just going to append to the end. And all I want to do here is write to that file this data that we received here. So if I just go ahead and check the data type of this data here, so I'll just leave that pass. And we'll print the type of the data here. So print type of data. You'll see that this data is actually a string. So it's not a dictionary as you might expect. It's actually a string. Looks like I really mangled this date time here. So it's date time dot now dot date. There we go. So we should start getting updates in a second. And you can see all of these updates are actually strings passed through the WebSocket. They're not dictionaries as they might appear, which is actually quite handy for us since we're saving everything down as text. And therefore, all we need to do is add a new line at the end of each string. And then our final file will have each update on its own line. When we replay the order book later on, we just have to go line by line through the updates. So we'll await the writing here. So write data plus a new line. Otherwise, they'll all be on one line. If you're not familiar with the await syntax here, it basically just tells Python that while this job is running, so while it's writing to the disk, if there's nothing to do, feel free to go and do something else. That's essentially what this await syntax means here. And then when the data has been written down to disk, continue with this function as normal. So this should work here if I get rid of all of this, or maybe I'll leave the print data here so we can watch the updates come in. We should have them all saving down to a file here. So you can see you've got uni, USDT, updates, and I can just follow this here. So if I do tail, then uni this tail dash F. I can watch these updates come in. So they're all saving down properly to disk, which is a relief. And so that's how we get the updates here on the order book. But we also need to get a snapshot if you remember, because these are just telling us how we can update a copy of the order book that we already have. So if we don't have that copy of the order book, this information isn't really that useful to us. Thankfully, that is fairly simple thanks to HTTP X here. So again, we have to go and get another URL from the documentation here. So if you go to market data endpoints, or in fact, all the way to the top of the API setup here, grab the URL for the base REST API, and we'll create a new variable here, and I'll call this the REST URL. So this is going to be different from the WebSocket URL. Another F string, I'll leave it as that for now. And I'll rename this one to WebSocket URL, since 
We don't want to get the two confused. And then if we go to our endpoints so or market data endpoints, I believe order book. So dash API slash three slash depth. Let's go grab those. And then there are a couple of parameters that you need to provide here. So they're on the documentation. Again, it's the symbol that you want, as well as the depth of the book that you want to grab. So some value between one and 5,000. So the symbol that I want, so params is equal to a dictionary. The symbol, well, that's going to be the pair dot upper. So it's going to be uni usdt in this particular case and then the limits well i'll leave that at 100 for now it's not massively important you can always increase this or decrease it as you need with something like uni there's going to be fewer levels in the order book than bitcoin so you don't need to request as wide a snapshot and so at this point, we're ready to fire off the request here and then save that down to disk. So it's again, another one of these asynchronous context managers. You've seen them quite a few times in this video. Async with HTTPX.async client with a capital A as our client. And then we can just make a regular get request here. So snapshots is equal to await. Again, if Python can be doing other things during this time, that's okay because we're just waiting for a request to come back here. So await client.get the rest URL and we'll set our params here. Params equals params. That's going to give us our snapshot. And I believe this will actually be a dictionary. We can print out the type here. So type of snapshot and see what it looks like. Doesn't look like that printed out there. Yeah, that's because we didn't add a print statement. Print the type of the snapshot. So it's a HTTPX.response. So we need to convert that to a JSON here. Or since we want the information as a string, we might just be able to ask for the text here. So let's see what that looks like. So print snapshot.text. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, that looks good to me. So we don't actually need to use .json like we would normally on a REST request. So we'll grab the text here and then we'll save that down. So we'll open up another context manager, another async with aiofiles.open. And it's going to be very similar to the other one. So we'll have the pair lower. Snapshots dash today's date. I think I actually set that down here. So I'll move this above here. And we'll add today in there. Dot txt as before, this is just a raw text file. We'll open it as f and then await f dot right snapshots plus new line. So each snapshot will live on its own new line there. I can delete these print statements here and run this. Yes, I need to set the write mode here. I believe it's automatically just read mode. We need to set the mode equal to append so that it will append to the end of the file. And it's not happy because I didn't grab the text from this snapshot here. So snapshot.text. And then we added the new line character onto that. Okay. So this should work now. If I go check that file on disk, there's a uni snapshots file and I pull it over here and you can see this is showing us all of the different bids and asks. It's got 100 levels on either side. And if I zoom out a lot, you can see that this is actually all on one line. If I go to the end of the file, the line counter in the bottom right is telling me that this is all one line. So if I close the file, close down our program here, then run the whole thing again, we'll get yet another snapshot. So if I open up that text file again, 
let's see what we got. You can see that, well, maybe you can't see, it's a bit small, but there's two of these last update IDs here, and the line counter in the bottom right is telling me that this is line number two. So that's great. We've got these saved down to disk. Now, you may wonder why we're using TXT files here. Might be worth explaining that. The first reason, and I think a very good one, is that it's very easy to read and write from these types of files. If you have one update per line, you can get Python to process the file one line at a time, and no matter how big it is, as long as one line can fit in your memory, you won't have any problems processing it, which makes it really easy and efficient to use. Another reason is that we want to maintain absolute precision on these bid and ask levels here, especially on the price side of things. We can't afford for this to be inaccurate in any way. And so saving it down as a string is a pretty good option overall in terms of long-term storage of data. It helps prevent floating point rounding errors. If you did want to save this down as a number rather than a string, then you'd either have to use a decimal type in a database system like Postgres, or you can multiply the whole thing. So instead of 7.12 uni, you'd multiply this by 100 and say 712 hundredths of a uni and then save it as an integer. Again, this avoids floating point problems. If you're not familiar with what I'm talking about here, when I'm talking about floating point numbers, you can see if we do some basic arithmetic here with some floating point numbers, so 1.123, and we'll minus 1.1 from that. You can see that this is not quite the answer you'd expect. We would expect this to give us 0 0.023, but because of the ways that floats are handled internally, you get this rather horrible number, which is normally fine if, let's say, you are measuring something like the time it takes for your response to be received by the exchange. But when you're dealing with units of currency, it's super, super important that we have this exactly correct, which is why saving as a string, although inefficient storage-wise, can be a good option here. So that's one strong reason to use something like a simple text file to store all of your data. It also makes it very easy to replay it. So like I said before, it's just one line per update. And then when you're simulating your order book in your historical backtests, super, super easy to do. You could store the bids and the asks here in something like a Postgres database. The main problem I found with that is that you then have to store lots of metadata about the particular bid and ask. So you have to store which update it belongs to, what time it was inserted into the database, and you have to store that on a per bid and ask basis rather than just once at the top here, which can be a real headache. And so overall, flat files are pretty decent as a storage format for order book data provided that you don't have terabytes of this stuff. And that's why we're just having one symbol in each file for each day. I just noticed there when looking at the snapshots that it doesn't actually tell you the time you took the snapshot of the order book. So you may want to include that. The way you would do that is you could just load this in here as a JSON format. So Instead of this, you could come down here and do snapshot is equal to snapshot.json. Then we could set a value for the time here. So snapshot time is equal to time.time. .time. So this is just going to give you the time in milliseconds. So we'll import time here. And then we'll just convert this back to a string with json.dumps and we'll pass in snapshot. So 
if I now read this on disk, after the snapshot's been taken, we'll open up this one. The last update here should have a time associated with it. So you can see right at the very bottom here, this has now got a time, which is the number of milliseconds here past the epoch time which is obviously very handy when you come to rewind this when you're doing your back tests. So that's the basics here as to how you can receive order book information from any data source. This will work for Forex, crypto, stocks. You'll generally have a REST URL where you can request a snapshot and a WebSocket where you can request updates. And then as long as you write down every single update, you can be confident that when you replay the whole thing, you'll have an accurate assessment of the order book as it was at that time. There are a couple of extensions that I would make to this system in order to take it to production. The first would be handling automatic disconnects. So you can see on the Binance documentation here over at the WebSocket section that after 24 hours you get disconnected and so you want a system in place for bringing up a new WebSocket before you get disconnected, killing the old WebSocket and continuing to stream your data. That's one thing that I would do to take this into production and the next would be to obviously take multiple snapshots. So we're just taking one snapshot here when we start the system and this will be completely fine for symbols like uni here. So if I get 5,000 levels, it's extremely unlikely that the price of uni will change that significantly during this 24 hour period. But you could imagine if we had our system for automatically reconnecting and this was running for weeks and weeks and weeks and months, eventually the price would move beyond that initial snapshot and we wouldn't have the amount of data that we actually need to continue building the order book. So another feature I would add to this system is whenever the price moves by a certain amount, say in response to some kind of news, I would take another snapshot at that point as well as my regular intervals so that we don't get caught out. Because for a coin like Bitcoin here, this 5,000 levels only gives you maybe a 1% move either side, at least in my testing. And Bitcoin can very easily move by 1% over the course of 20, 30 minutes. And so you want to make sure that you take snapshots whenever there's a significant price movement or after a longer period of time. Let me know in the comments if you want me to go into more detail about how we can build production systems to save down, store, and replay order book data. And I'll see you in the next video.